The genesis we know today is the product of centuries of transmission, translation, and transformation. But what if I told you that the story of creation as we read it now was not the original version? What if there are hidden layers within the Hebrew Bible that reveal an even older, more complex narrative? The Hebrew Bible, known as the Tanakh, is a collection of texts that were compiled and edited over centuries. The oldest parts of Genesis likely date back to around the 10th century BCE, during the time of the United Monarchy of Israel under Kings David and Solomon. But these texts didn't appear out of nowhere. They were the culmination of oral traditions, ancient stories passed down through generations, that were finally written down and edited to reflect the theological and political needs of the time. One of the most striking examples of these hidden layers is the presence of different sources within the text itself. Scholars have identified at least four main sources, known as the J, E, P, and D sources, which were woven together to create the final version of the Torah. These sources reflect different traditions, perspectives, and even different times in Israel's history. The J source, for example, is believed to have been written in the southern kingdom of Judah around the 10th century BCE. This source is characterized by its use of the name Yahweh for God and its focus on the human, earthy aspects of the divine. The E source, on the other hand, comes from the northern kingdom of Israel and uses the name Elohim for God, reflecting a more distant, transcendent view of the divine. The P source, likely written during the Babylonian exile in the 6th century BCE, is priestly and concerned with ritual, order, and genealogy. Finally, the D source is associated with the reforms of King Josiah in the 7th century BCE and emphasizes covenant and law. These sources didn't just reflect different religious views, they also represented different political realities. The J source, for instance, may have been written to legitimize the Davidic dynasty in Jerusalem, while the P source sought to preserve the traditions of the priesthood during a time of exile and uncertainty. When these sources were combined into the text we now know as Genesis, they created a narrative that is rich, multi-layered, and sometimes even contradictory. Take the creation story, for example. In Genesis 1, we have the familiar seven-day creation account, where God methodically creates the world, day by day, culminating in the creation of humanity in his image. This is the P source, with its emphasis on order, structure, and the majesty of the divine. But in Genesis 2, we get a different version of the story, one where God is portrayed as a potter, shaping Adam from the dust of the ground and breathing life into him. This is the J source, which presents a more intimate, anthropomorphic view of God. These two accounts were never meant to be read as a single, seamless narrative. They are the remnants of different traditions, each telling its own story about the origins of the world and humanity's place within it. And yet, they were brought together into a single text, creating a complex, multifaceted picture of creation. But why were these different stories preserved? Why not choose one and discard the others? The answer lies in the nature of the Hebrew Bible itself. This was a text that was meant to unify a diverse people, to bring together different tribes, traditions, and beliefs into a single religious and cultural identity. By preserving these different voices, the editors of Genesis created a text that could speak to everyone, that could resonate with the varied experiences and perspectives of the Israelite people. This brings us back to the idea of Genesis as a palimpsest, a text with layers of meaning, where the original stories are still visible beneath the surface, if you know where to look. The Genesis we have today is not just a creation story, it is a record of centuries of history, theology, and culture, all woven together into a single, intricate tapestry. As we peel back these layers, we discover that the story of creation is not just about the beginning of the world, it is about the beginning of a people, a nation, and a faith that has endured for millennia. The story of creation as we know it from the book of Genesis is one that has been told for thousands of years. It's a story that many believe is as old as humanity itself. But what if I told you that the origins of this story are much older, deeply rooted in the ancient civilization of Sumer, over 4,000 years ago? This isn't just a retelling of an old tale, this is about uncovering the threads of history that weave through time, connecting the Sumerian myths to the creation story we find in Genesis. In the ancient city of Uruk, one of the first great cities of the world, there lived a king named Gilgamesh. His story, 
chronicled in the Epic of Gilgamesh, is one of the earliest surviving works of literature. But the epic is more than just a tale of a king's adventures, it contains echoes of stories that would later be reflected in the Bible, particularly in Genesis. The Sumerians, who flourished in Mesopotamia, modern-day Iraq, around 3500 BC, had their own creation myths. They believed that the world was created by the gods Anu, Enlil, and Enki, who brought order out of chaos. According to their myths, the god Enki, also known as Ea in Akkadian mythology, played a crucial role in the creation of humanity. He was the god of wisdom, water, and creation, a figure strikingly similar to the biblical god who forms man from the dust of the earth. One of the most fascinating aspects of the Sumerian myths is the story of the flood. Long before Noah built his ark, the Sumerians told of a great deluge sent by the gods to destroy humanity, with only a single man, Zeusudra, surviving by building a boat. Sound familiar? This story, recorded on ancient clay tablets, is nearly identical to the Genesis account of Noah's ark. It's almost as if the flood story in Genesis is a distant echo of this ancient Sumerian tale. But the connections don't stop there. The Sumerians also had a tree of life, guarded by serpents and tales of divine beings who descended from the heavens to interact with humanity. These themes, found in the Epic of Gilgamesh and other Sumerian texts, mirror the stories of the Garden of Eden, the Tree of Knowledge, and the Tempting Serpent. So, what does this all mean? It suggests that the creation story in Genesis is not a standalone narrative, but part of a much older tradition. It's a story that has been told and retold, evolving over millennia as it passed from the Sumerians to the Akkadians, Babylonians, and eventually to the Israelites. As these cultures interacted and influenced each other, their myths merged, adapted, and were reinterpreted to fit new religious and cultural contexts. In the heart of ancient Sumer, where the Tigris and Euphrates rivers meet, a civilization was born that would forever change the course of history. The Sumerians, known for their advanced cities and complex mythology, worshipped a pantheon of gods and goddesses who ruled every aspect of life. Among these deities, two stood out for their power and influence, Inanna, the goddess of love, war, and fertility, and Enlil, the god of air, king of the gods, and the one who decreed the fates of all. Inanna was no ordinary goddess. She was a force of nature, often depicted as both nurturing and destructive. Her dual nature made her one of the most revered and feared deities in the Sumerian pantheon. She wasn't just a goddess of love and beauty, she was also a fierce warrior who could bring nations to their knees. Her temples, the most famous being the Yana Temple in Uruk, were centers of worship where rituals dedicated to her were performed. These rituals often involved sacred marriages, symbolizing the union of the divine and the mortal, reflecting her role as a bridge between heaven and earth. But Inanna's story isn't just about love and war. One of her most intriguing myths is her descent into the underworld, a journey that echoes themes found in other ancient stories. She descended into the dark realm ruled by her sister, Ereshkigal, in an attempt to seize power, but her ambition led to her death and subsequent resurrection. This tale of death and rebirth, filled with drama and emotion, is one of the oldest examples of a story that would later be mirrored in various religious traditions. Enlil, on the other hand, was a god of order and authority. As the chief god of the Sumerian pantheon, he held the tablets of destiny, the divine decrees that determined the fate of gods and men alike. His influence was immense, he was the god who separated heaven from earth, establishing the boundaries of the cosmos. His temple, the Ikarin Nippur, was not just a place of worship, but a symbol of his dominion over the world. One of Enlil's most famous acts was his role in the Great Flood, a cataclysmic event sent to cleanse the earth of humanity's corruption. It was Enlil who decided that mankind had become too noisy, too disruptive, and so he ordered the Flood to silence them once and for all. But not all the gods agreed with Enlil's harsh judgment. It was the god Enki, known for his wisdom and compassion, who secretly warned a man named Zeusudra to build a boat and save himself and the animals, a story that resonates with the later tale of Noah in the Bible. The dynamic between Inanna and Enlil reflects the tension between chaos and order, passion and reason. Inanna, with her unpredictable nature, and Enlil, with his strict adherence to cosmic law, represent the dual forces that shape the world. 
Their stories are not just about gods and goddesses, they are about the forces that govern human existence, the struggles and triumphs that define life itself. Inanna's influence wasn't confined to Sumer alone. She was known by many names across different cultures, Ishtar to the Akkadians and Babylonians, Astar to the Canaanites, and even linked to the Greek goddess Aphrodite. Her worship spread far and wide, becoming one of the most enduring symbols of feminine power and complexity in the ancient world. Enlil's authority, too, extended beyond Sumer, as he became synonymous with the concept of divine kingship in later Mesopotamian cultures. Continuing from the intricate tales of Inanna and Enlil, we move from the plains of Sumer to the bustling metropolis of Babylon, where another powerful myth emerged, the Enuma Elish, the Babylonian creation epic that shaped the way we understand the origins of the universe. Picture the city of Babylon around 1800 BC, a sprawling urban center with towering ziggurats and grand palaces. This was a city where the gods were ever-present, their images carved into stone and their stories told in every corner. But among these tales, one stood out as the defining narrative of the Babylonian cosmos, the Enuma Elish. This epic poem, named after its opening words, When on High, begins in a time before time, when the world was nothing but a chaotic, swirling mass of water. Out of this primordial chaos emerge two primordial beings, Apsu, the god of fresh water, and Tiamat, the goddess of salt water. Their union gave birth to the first generation of gods, but their offspring were unruly, disrupting the peace of their parents with their ceaseless noise and activity. Apsu, unable to bear the chaos any longer, decided to destroy his children, but his plan was thwarted by Ea, the god of wisdom and magic, who killed Apsu to protect the younger gods. Enraged by the death of her consort, Tiamat, the embodiment of chaos itself, sought revenge. She created an army of monstrous creatures and appointed Kingu, her favored child, as the leader of her forces. As the battle between order and chaos loomed, the younger gods were paralyzed with fear. But then came Marduk, the storm god, and the hero of the Babylonian pantheon. Marduk was no ordinary god, he was a god born for this moment, endowed with extraordinary power and wisdom. The gods pleaded with Marduk to save them, and in return, they promised him the ultimate reward, supreme authority over all the gods if he could defeat Tiamat. Marduk accepted the challenge, and the epic confrontation began. Armed with a net, a bow, and a powerful storm, Marduk faced Tiamat in a battle that shook the very foundations of the universe. He captured Tiamat in his net, filled her with an evil wind, and then pierced her heart with an arrow. With Tiamat defeated, Marduk split her body in two, creating the heavens from one half and the earth from the other. He then took Kingu, the leader of Tiamat's army, and from Kingu's blood, he created humanity, destined to serve the gods. This tale of cosmic conflict, creation, and the rise of Marduk as the supreme god was more than just a myth, it was a declaration of Babylon's place in the world. The Enuma Elish was recited annually during the Akitu festival, a New Year celebration that reinforced Marduk's rule and, by extension, Babylon's dominance over the ancient Near East. But the significance of the Enuma Elish doesn't end with Babylon. The themes of chaos being subdued by divine order, the creation of the world from a slain being, and the role of humanity as servants of the gods resonate deeply with the creation narrative found in Genesis. The very structure of Genesis, starting with chaos, followed by divine creation, and ending with humanity's place in the world, mirrors the Enuma Elish. This connection between the Enuma Elish and Genesis suggests that the biblical creation story is not an isolated account, but part of a much older and broader tradition. The Enuma Elish, with its dramatic battles, complex characters, and cosmic scale, provides a lens through which we can better understand the Genesis narrative. It also raises intriguing questions about the transmission of these stories, how they evolved, adapted, and were ultimately enshrined in the sacred texts of different cultures. As we move from the grand myths of Babylon, where the Enuma Elish laid the foundation for the cosmos, we now delve into the shadows, into the realm of the apocryphal and banned texts. These are the stories that didn't make it into the official canon, the tales deemed too controversial, too mysterious, or simply too dangerous to be included in the sacred scriptures. In the ancient world, knowledge was power, and control over that knowledge was a way to maintain authority. 
This is where the apocryphal texts come into play. These were books written alongside the more accepted scriptures but often hidden away, kept from the public eye by religious authorities who feared their content could challenge the established order. One of the most intriguing of these texts is the Book of Enoch. Written sometime between the 3rd century BC and the 1st century AD, this text was revered by early Jewish and Christian communities but was later excluded from the biblical canon. Enoch, the great-grandfather of Noah, is taken on a journey through the heavens, where he encounters the Watchers, fallen angels who descended to earth and corrupted humanity. These Watchers are directly linked to the origins of evil in the world, and their story adds a layer of complexity to the creation narrative, suggesting that the fall of man began not in Eden, but with the arrival of these celestial beings. The Book of Jubilees, another apocryphal work, retells the Genesis narrative with significant alterations. Known as the Little Genesis, it provides detailed chronologies and expands on the relationships between the patriarchs, offering a timeline that diverges from the traditional account. This text was highly influential in some Jewish sects and early Christian communities, but its more mystical elements and deviation from the canonical texts led to its marginalization. And then there's the Apocalypse of Adam, a Gnostic text discovered among the Nag Hammadi Library in Egypt. This work presents a radical reinterpretation of the Genesis story, where Adam, after being expelled from Eden, reveals secret knowledge to his son Seth. This knowledge, passed down through generations, challenges the authority of the creator God described in Genesis, suggesting a hidden divine truth known only to a select few. The Apocalypse of Adam paints a picture of a world where the true origins of humanity are far more complex and contested than the traditional narrative suggests. These texts, along with others like the Testament of Solomon and the Book of the Giants, offer tantalizing glimpses into a world where the story of creation is anything but straightforward. They present alternative timelines, characters, and events that challenge the simplicity of the Genesis narrative, suggesting that the story of humanity's beginnings was a subject of debate and reinterpretation for centuries. The existence of these apocryphal and banned texts raises questions about the process of canonization, how certain stories were selected for inclusion in the Bible, while others were left on the margins, forgotten or deliberately suppressed. This process wasn't just about theology, it was about power, control, and the shaping of religious and cultural identity. As we journey deeper into the ancient texts, from the hidden apocryphal books to the epic tales of Enuma Elish, we find ourselves standing at the crossroads of myth and history. In the Genesis account, we're introduced to a world that begins in darkness and chaos, a formless void over which the Spirit of God hovers. Then, with the divine command, let there be light, creation begins. This image of light emerging from darkness, order from chaos, is a theme that resonates across cultures and epochs, speaking to a universal human experience. Take, for example, the ancient Egyptian myth of creation. Long before the pyramids stood tall against the sky, the Egyptians believed that the world began in a state of watery chaos called Enu. From this chaos emerged Atom, the first god, who stood on a primordial mound and spoke the world into existence. Sound familiar? The parallels to the Genesis account are striking, both stories start with a formless, chaotic void and a divine figure who brings forth creation through speech. Now, let's travel to the ancient Norse myth of creation. Here, we find the story of Janungagap, a vast, empty void that existed before anything else. To the north lay the icy realm of Nivelheim, and to the south, the fiery land of Muspelheim. When the heat of Muspelheim met the cold of Nivelheim, it created Ymir, the first giant, whose body would later be used by the gods to create the world. Again, we see the theme of creation emerging from a chaotic, primordial state, a recurring motif that links the Norse mythology to the Genesis narrative. Across the ocean, in the ancient land of the Maya, the Popol Vuh tells a similar story of creation from chaos. The gods, after several failed attempts, finally create humans from maize, but this act of creation is preceded by a world shrouded in darkness and confusion. The gods debate and struggle to bring forth the light, and through their efforts, the first dawn breaks, marking the beginning of time. The interplay of darkness and light, chaos and order, once again echoes the themes found in Genesis. But perhaps the most profound connection is found in the ancient Hindu text, the Rigveda. 
In this sacred scripture, the universe begins with a primordial ocean, and from it arises the golden embryo, Hiranyagarbha, who creates the heavens and the earth. The Rigveda describes this moment of creation as a time when there was neither existence nor non-existence, neither the realm of space nor the sky which is beyond. It's a poetic reflection of the same cosmic uncertainty and potential that we find at the beginning of Genesis. These archetypal stories, whether from Egypt, Scandinavia, the Maya, or India, are not just isolated cultural narratives, they are the universal expressions of humanity's attempt to understand the origins of existence. They tell us that before the world was formed, there was chaos, an abyss, a void, a darkness, and from this chaos, through the will of the divine, the cosmos was born. In Genesis, this archetype is manifested through the separation of light from darkness, the creation of land from the waters, and the formation of life from the earth. To understand the Genesis of Genesis, we have to go back to a time long before it was written down, back to the ancient Near East, where the Israelites were just one of many tribes inhabiting the region. Around 1800 BCE, the early patriarchs like Abraham were likely nomadic herders, moving through the lands of Canaan, Mesopotamia, and Egypt. These were lands steeped in stories, tales of gods, creation, and the origins of life, passed down through generations. During this period, the Israelites would have encountered the myths and legends of the surrounding cultures, such as the Sumerians, Babylonians, and Canaanites. These stories, rich with symbolism and meaning, didn't just stay confined to their original cultures, they spread and mingled, influencing the oral traditions of the Israelites. It was a time when borders were fluid, and ideas traveled along with goods and people. As the Israelites settled in Canaan, these oral traditions began to solidify. The story of a single, omnipotent God who created the world from nothing, a stark contrast to the chaotic, often violent creation myths of their neighbors, began to take shape. This was a time of identity formation, where the Israelites were defining themselves in opposition to the surrounding cultures. Their creation story became a statement of who they were and what they believed. Fast forward to the 10th century BCE, during the reign of King David and Solomon, when Israel was a united kingdom with Jerusalem as its capital. It was during this time that the earliest written versions of these oral traditions likely began to appear. The J and E sources, which we discussed earlier, are believed to have been written during this period, reflecting the political and theological concerns of the newly established kingdom. But the story doesn't end there. In the 8th century BCE, the northern kingdom of Israel fell to the Assyrians, and many of its people were exiled. The survivors fled to the southern kingdom of Judah, bringing with them their own traditions and stories. It was during this period of upheaval and uncertainty that the Peace Source emerged, a priestly text that sought to preserve the traditions of the Israelites in the face of foreign domination and cultural assimilation. The final piece of the puzzle came during the Babylonian exile in the 6th century BCE. The Israelites were taken from their homeland, their temple destroyed, and their identity as a people was under threat. It was in Babylon, surrounded by the grandeur of a foreign empire and its powerful myths, that the Israelites began to compile and edit their sacred texts into the form we recognize today. The creation story in Genesis, with its clear, orderly progression from chaos to cosmos, was not just a religious narrative, it was a declaration of faith in the face of exile and uncertainty. By placing their God at the center of the creation of the world, the Israelites were asserting their identity and their belief in a divine plan, even in the midst of displacement and despair. This process of compilation, editing, and synthesis continued even after the return from exile. The final form of Genesis, as part of the Torah, was likely completed around the 5th century BCE. It was a text born out of centuries of experience, of migration, conquest, exile, and return. We arrive at one of the most dramatic and universally resonant stories in the Bible, the story of the Great Flood. But here's the thing, the tale of a catastrophic flood isn't unique to Genesis. In fact, flood myths appear in cultures all around the world, each with its own variations, but often with striking similarities. These stories are among the oldest recorded in human history, suggesting that they touch on something deeply rooted in the human experience. Let's start with the Epic of Gilgamesh, one of the earliest and most famous flood myths. 
Written around 2100 BCE in ancient Mesopotamia, this epic centers on the adventures of Gilgamesh, the king of Uruk. But it's the story of Utnapishtim, a wise man who survives a great flood that echoes the Genesis narrative most closely. The gods, angered by humanity's sins, decide to wipe out all life with a flood. But the god Ea, known for his wisdom and compassion, warns Utnapishtim in a dream, instructing him to build a massive boat and bring his family and every kind of animal aboard. Sound familiar? Utnapishtim's ark endures the storm, and when the waters recede, he sends out a dove and a raven to find dry land, just like Noah. This story wasn't just confined to Mesopotamia. The ancient Greeks had their own version in the myth of Deucalion and Pyrrha. Zeus, the king of the gods, decides to flood the earth to cleanse it of human wickedness. Deucalion, warned by his father Prometheus, builds an ark to save himself and his wife, Pyrrha. After the floodwaters subside, they repopulate the earth by throwing stones over their shoulders, which transform into humans. Again, we see the theme of divine wrath, survival through a boat, and the rebirth of humanity. Moving across the globe, the story of Manu in Hindu mythology also carries these echoes. In the asterisk Satapatha Brahmana asterisk, Manu, the progenitor of humanity, is warned by a fish about an impending flood. The fish instructs him to build a boat and tie it to the fish's horn to be led to safety. Manu does so, and when the flood comes, he survives, later performing rituals that give rise to a new human race. Even in the Americas, among the ancient Maya, we find the story of the asterisk Popol Vuh asterisk, where the gods, dissatisfied with their earlier creations, decide to destroy the world with a flood. The few survivors later repopulate the earth, adding another layer to the global tapestry of flood myths. These flood stories aren't just isolated legends, they reflect a shared human memory of catastrophic floods that occurred during ancient times, events so traumatic and significant that they were immortalized in the myths of multiple cultures. But more than that, they speak to a universal human concern, the relationship between humanity and the divine, the consequences of moral failure, and the hope of redemption and renewal. In Genesis, the flood story serves as a pivotal moment in the narrative, marking a transition from the old world to a new one, cleansed and renewed by God's judgment. But it's important to recognize that this story is part of a much larger, ancient tradition. The biblical flood echoes the stories of Gilgamesh, Deucalion, Manu, and others, showing that the theme of divine retribution and survival is one that has resonated across cultures and centuries. What makes the Genesis flood story unique, however, is its emphasis on covenant. After the flood, God makes a promise to Noah, symbolized by the rainbow, that never again will a flood destroy the earth. This covenant marks a turning point in the relationship between God and humanity, offering not just survival, but a guarantee of divine mercy and protection for future generations. As we continue our exploration of Genesis and its ancient roots, we come across a powerful connection to the myths of Mesopotamia, particularly the story surrounding the Anunnaki and their leader, Enlil. The Anunnaki were a group of deities in ancient Mesopotamian culture, believed to be the offspring of the sky god Anu and the earth goddess Ki. They were seen as the divine rulers of the world, with each god assigned a specific domain. But among them, Enlil stood out as the most powerful, he was the god of air, wind, and storms, and he held the authority to control the fates of both gods and humans. Enlil was not just a god of nature, he was a god of order, law, and authority. He was revered as the protector of the cosmos, ensuring that the divine order was maintained. But with this power came a fearsome responsibility, Enlil was also known for his harsh judgments and his role in deciding the fate of humanity. One of the most significant myths involving Enlil is the asterisk Atrahasis asterisk epic, an ancient Babylonian story that predates the Genesis flood narrative. In this tale, Enlil grows increasingly frustrated with the noise and chaos created by humans. Their constant clamor disturbs his peace, and in response, he decides to wipe out humanity through a series of plagues, culminating in a great flood. Sound familiar? The parallels to the story of Noah are striking. In the asterisk Atrahasis asterisk epic, the flood is not just a natural disaster, it's a divine punishment, decreed by Enlil to restore balance to the world. But, just as in Genesis, there is a figure who defies this divine decree to save humanity. 
In the Sumerian version, it is the god Enki, Ea in Akkadian, Enlil's brother, who intervenes. Enki, known for his wisdom and compassion, warns the hero Atrahasis of the impending flood, instructing him to build a boat to save himself, his family, and the animals. The flood comes, devastating the earth, but Atrahasis survives, and after the waters recede, Enlil is furious to find that humanity has escaped his wrath. However, Enki intervenes again, persuading Enlil to show mercy and allow humans to continue, albeit under stricter divine control. This story, with its themes of divine anger, judgment, and eventual mercy, lays the groundwork for the later Genesis narrative. But Enlil's influence doesn't end with the flood. As the chief god of the Anunnaki, Enlil was also deeply involved in the creation of humanity itself. According to Sumerian mythology, the Anunnaki created humans to serve the gods, to take on the labor of the earth so that the gods could live in leisure. This idea of humans as servants of the divine is a concept that permeates many ancient cultures and finds echoes in the Genesis story, where humanity is created to inhabit and cultivate the Garden of Eden, fulfilling a divine purpose. The Anunnaki, and particularly Enlil, represent a worldview in which the gods are not just distant creators, but active participants in the world, shaping the fate of humanity through their decisions and actions. This perspective offers a stark contrast to the monotheistic vision of Genesis, where a single, omnipotent god creates and governs the world. But with every retelling, every adaptation, something is lost, and something new is added, leaving us with a complex tapestry that is as much a reflection of humanity's evolving understanding of the divine as it is a record of our ancient past. The ancient world was a melting pot of ideas, beliefs, and stories. From the bustling cities of Mesopotamia to the deserts of Canaan and the mighty empire of Babylon, people shared their myths, their gods, and their understanding of the cosmos. These interactions created a rich cultural exchange that influenced the way the Israelites saw the world and how they ultimately told their story in Genesis. Throughout this journey, we've touched on the stories of Inanna and Enlil, the Anunnaki, and the Epic of Gilgamesh, all of which left their mark on the Genesis narrative. But there's one more piece to this puzzle, the legacy of ancient knowledge itself, and how much of it has been lost to time. In the ancient libraries of Babylon, such as the famous library of Ashurbanipal, vast collections of texts, myths, and scientific knowledge were kept. These libraries were the repositories of the ancient world's wisdom, holding within their walls the stories and teachings that shaped civilizations. But as empires fell, so too did these great libraries. Many of these texts were lost, destroyed, or buried beneath the sands of time. The knowledge contained within them, much of it never to be recovered, represented a world of understanding that was once shared by many but is now known by few. This loss is not just about missing books or forgotten stories, it's about losing a connection to our past, to the ways in which our ancestors understood the world and their place within it. The myths that once explained the mysteries of life, the universe, and the divine have been replaced by new stories, new interpretations, but the echoes of the old remain, hidden within the texts that have survived. Genesis is one of those texts, a survivor of a long and complex history of storytelling. But even Genesis, with all its richness and depth, is just one version of a much larger narrative. The stories of creation, the flood, and the origins of humanity have been told and retold in countless ways across the ancient world, each version carrying its own truth, its own wisdom. What we have in Genesis is not the original story, but a story shaped by the legacy of those that came before, by the knowledge that was passed down, and by the understanding of a people who were trying to make sense of their world. This brings us to a crucial point, while we may never recover all that has been lost, we can still learn from what remains. The Genesis narrative, influenced as it is by the ancient myths of Sumer, Babylon, and beyond, offers us a glimpse into the mind of the ancient world. It shows us how our ancestors grappled with the big questions of existence, how they saw the hand of the divine in the world around them, and how they sought to understand their place in the grand scheme of things. In the end, the legacy of ancient knowledge is not just about what has been lost, but also about what has been preserved, passed down, and transformed into the stories we know today. Genesis, with all its ancient echoes, continues to speak to us, reminding us of our shared history, our common struggles, and our enduring quest for meaning. 
As we reflect on these connections, I'd like to leave you with a verse that encapsulates the spirit of this journey. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Proverbs 1 verse 7. Thank you for watching this video and for joining us on this exploration of Genesis and its ancient roots. If you found this content interesting, please give it a like, leave a comment below with your thoughts, and don't forget to subscribe for more videos like this. God bless you all.